Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Unlearning Talk series of the Start, Create, Cultural Change event. The Unlearning Talks is a series of talks on resilience and sustainability in the sociocultural sector with a focus on Southeastern Europe. My name is Maria Luisa Laupodi. I am speaking to you from Thessaloniki in Greece, and I will be your host for this online event. This event is part of the START program. START is a capacity building and fellowship program for aspiring cultural managers from Greece. The program supports creative minds to kickstart cultural initiatives that generate a positive social impact on their local communities. This year, the START program has supported again 30 cultural managers from Greece by offering a professional placement in 30 different sociocultural centers in Germany. 15 of those cultural managers have moved forward and with the program support, they have implemented their innovative initiatives in nine cities around Greece until June 2020. I would like to take you through this journey with a short video we have prepared. The START program is coming to a conclusion this year, and while thinking how we would like to conclude, we understood that a lot of the work that had been developed in the projects we supported could be relevant to other areas in our region. And similarly, other projects could have a lot to share with our community. So we designed this series of talks to spread beyond Greece and Germany and in the Southeastern European spaces very often Challenges remain the same when working towards sustainable cultural interventions. The unlearning talks evolve around three thematic cycles. Cycle one, coping with emerging crises, challenges and trends. Cycle two, resilient models of sociocultural entrepreneurship. And cycle three, building new collaborative methods of cooperation and networks, which concludes the talks and ends tomorrow, October 1st. Each cycle spans over three days, from Tuesday to Thursday every week. Every day there is a different topic and a very rich lineup of speakers from Southeastern Europe. For more information, you can visit the startgreece.net website. You as an audience can ask them any questions you wish by downloading the Slido app, either on Google Play or the App Store. The event code on Slido is hashtag three, one, four, six, seven. So let me take you through today's program. Today's talk is part of the third and last cycle, and it is entitled Restoring and Accelerating International Collaboration in Southeastern Europe. Today's topic focuses on the challenges posed in collaboration building and how those vary considerably from place to place building resilient networks of collaboration that are operating beyond borders is more complex than it seems. This discussion maps the characteristics that define a fruitful international collaboration and together with our five panelists, we will present practical strategies that improve a network's ability to catalyze growth in Southeastern Europe. Before we go into more details, I would like to welcome our international sign language translator, Apostolis Margaritidis. The shift to online events offers the possibility to more people from different locations to access the content. In our efforts to be as inclusive as possible, we believe that offering such interpretation can widen the audience and the dialogue for cultural development. We will start with the presentations of our five speakers and then continue to the Q&A. This part of the Q&A is participatory by design as you, the audience, can join by sending to us your questions and comments. 
Moving forward, I would like to welcome the speakers of the eighth and learning talk. Darius Pollock from the International Alumni Center in Germany, Valentin Schmel from the Other Music Academy in Germany as well, Yonida Gashi from the Debatik Center of Contemporary Art in Albania, Michalis Karakatsanis from the Cyprus Music Information Center in Cyprus, and Clary Bakura from the Institute of Entrepreneurship Development in Greece. Welcome to all of you and thank you for joining us. So let's start with the first speaker, Darius Pollock. Since 2017, Darius is CEO of IAC Berlin, a think and do tank for impact oriented networks in philanthropy. The International Alumni Center Berlin coordinates the Bosch Alumni Network, a global community of partners and friends of the Robert Bosch Foundation. His professional path naturally led him from NGOs in the field of citizenship, education, and cultural exchange to systemic approaches in philanthropy. Darius strongly believes that networks matter and that they can be an asset when it comes to tackling complex challenges. He will present to us the very nature of network building. Darius, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you everybody for inviting me to talk um, on this panel of the eighth unlearning talks um, about impact oriented networks. Um, I would like to start with an observation. What can we learn from living systems? And what I choose is here, this murmuration of starlings. What you can see here is that there is no central steering entity. There are simple principles that create complex behavior. There's a purpose that leads to a behavior and a way through this behavior, we can see the purpose of this network of animals. There are delays, non-linearity and lack of firm boundaries. Let's get back to the main characteristics of networks as a preparation for what I want to share with you. Networks are a set of elements, we call them nodes, relationships, we call them links and the patterns they create. The patterns influence the quality of communication and the likelihood of collaboration and innovation. When we talk about network leadership and facilitation, we talk about the capacity of the nodes and hubs, about facilitation of the relations and the facilitation of the emerging of patterns. If we see network building as a process throughout time, we see that we start with scattered fragments. Very often there is a driver, there could be one person, a group of people, could be some organization that's starting to connect these dots in a hub and spoke moment. And then it starts to be complicated, how to get out of this centralized model, to get to a multi-hub structure that could lead us to self-organization at the end. And I want to share with you some observation that might be also relevant for networks in Southeastern Europe. First of all, there are challenges. Uh, in a very uh, abstract way, we could call them transactional costs that are created by geographic barriers, cultural language differences, not just between nations, but also between sectors and organizations, lack of trust, lack of leadership and collaboration skills and experiences, and what I will continue to talk about, social network failures. Let's start with the three glues of social networks. What connects people and what brings us to the situation that we want to invest time and other resources to stay connected? First of all, we see networks of belonging, people who share an experience, we call them fellows. They want to stay, stay together. They want to reconnect. We see transactional networks, very fruitful and strong, mostly professional ones, sharing of contacts and knowledge and competences is what they do. And they are now oriented. Um, and the third, the most relevant for us, transformative networks, purpose driven, where members are beginning to be initiators and innovators, change makers for the societies. These are networks that are future oriented. The question for us at Network Builders is how to combine these three glues to make strong networks. We see four elements that could be helpful. First of all, for us Network Builders, how to close triangles and not just by us being those connectors, but also how to introduce a logic of closing triangles within the network. How to spark micro collaboration. Collaboration is a muscle and this muscle has to be trained. And do we have a program? Do we have an attractive incentive to start spark micro collaboration within our networks? We cultivate a large and diverse periphery. 
very often we think that those people on the side on the periphery are not relevant, but they are because the purpose can change. And as you saw with the, with the murmuration of sparlings, there could be somebody else leading us into a new activity. And those people are valuable. How do we deal with them? And sharing learnings and identify high leverage project is a fourth element. Do we have all the four within our network? How to start, how to decide what to do in a network? Uh, we could do an analytic perspective or momentum driven approach, both is okay. And what I want to share with you today are the four net, uh, the three network failures we see here. Connectors, people who connect the people, they are very valuable, but they make networks vulnerable. If they are gone, these other dots, these other people would be disconnected. How to support them to stay in this role and to support others to take over the role. Influencers connect us with the periphery. How to support these influencers? Otherwise, we would be disconnected to the periphery. And at the third, Bridge builders that connect different sub-networks are very relevant, but they also could become bottlenecks or gatekeepers. So do we have a program to support these three types of network builders within our networks? I see four principles that could be very relevant. And thanks to Janeway Skillern, I just want to share with you these four principles for collaboration success. Focus on mission before organizations. Build partnerships based on trust, not control. Promote other rather than yourself and build constellations rather than lone stars. You can use the communities for impact as a website. We shared our um, experiences with you and I would like to thank you and wish you all the best by building your networks for the future. Thank you very much Darius for this presentation. Let us now invite the next speaker also from Germany. Valentin Schmel is a performer, dance scholar and cultural activist. His sociocultural interdisciplinary and intercultural projects interweave artistic, social and scientific practices. He works for the other music academy in Weimar in East Germany, co-shaping the vision of a new form of social institution and empowerment center. Among other things, since 2019, he co-develops the Roundtable Funding Structures, a platform to share critique and thoughts on funding structures from inside cultural work. He will present to us this Roundtable, a project supported from inter the International Alumni Center. Valentin, welcome. You can start your presentation. Thank you. So this is me being here in Berlin. Um, yeah, thank you for the introduction. What I want to talk with you about now is briefly I'll tell you about the roundtable funding structures and then relate it back to networks. The main focus here for me is about social dimensions of working in the cultural field in relation to funding. Um, so the roundtable on funding structures, the basic idea of it is that we are all experts in what we do, uh, both funders and those who use the funds, the cultural workers. Um, but we don't really have a platform that is accessible um, to discuss the ways that we want to work together. Um, and we believe that that's an issue. And interestingly enough, maybe it's not the right term, but maybe we can call it unionizing or so. Um, but in, in itself, this is the desire to form a network with each other uh, of communication, because the main um, thought that we like the, the basic principle in, with which we started this work is thinking that we have the same aims. It's about driving positive societal change and from, from both sides, if we talk about both sides, funders and receivers. Um, and so this, this round table happened within the culture cluster of the Bosch alumni network. Um, and it consisted out of a survey that is still running online um, and um, live meetings that we had. And we discussed many different topics. A lot of them were more technical in the sense of like what kind of grants are helpful and how does the how should the application process look like and so forth. Um, what I want to focus now on though is one bigger chunk of conversation that we had about process oriented funding rather than product oriented funding. Um, and that relates a lot also to the ways we communicate with funders and communicates with each other. Um, and the the relation this has to networks is that processes networks in themselves represent uh, processes because they are in that sense open-ended that it is about bringing people together and kind of see what happens and use that dynamic that is open-ended 
um, and that wants also to evolve something that is unpredictable or like basics of it, of it are predictable. But um, so the, the basic way that usually we work nowadays in funding is that we apply with something that is in itself a finished project that leaves little wiggle space for explorations. Um, and networks, international networks, cross-sectorial networks have the potential to bring upon innovative ideas and exchange that otherwise none of us alone would be able to, to design. Um, and that relation of it is something that we discussed a lot of what is it, what is the relation in funding structure? What do we need to focus on more in order to get there? Um, there were some um, best practice examples. START was one of them. Uh, the Tandem, the Tandem program, for example, the Ban alumni, the Bosch alumni network in itself, um, and the principles that we came up with were a lot talking about the personal relation between funders and receivers. Um, that there should be less. The whole design, also of a network in itself, should be less driven by, or uh, the quality of prestige shouldn't should be very absent. <laughs> like it shouldn't be about doing fancy things, but about much more like having uh, mutual encounters with humans. So that means also the whole methodology of how we design the meetings, um, uh, how we interact with each other, uh, the methods that are applied should be very socially informed. Um, rather than coming from a more stiff professional uh, logic. Um, and I want to read to you some uh, quotes that we generated within it, because I think they tell in itself. So one is that there are millions of artistic products in the more world. What we need is more processes. It's about to give time to giving artists the time and structure to do their work without too many restrictions. Risk is possible, so failure should be possible too. That was a dimension we talked a lot about, is how open do we actually, are we able to talk about also our failures and just this mode of let's see what happens because you are a trustworthy person, because you are an expert with what you do and you can prove it. Um, so this all summarized into less pressure generates better outcome, which also relates to what we know generally from conferences, for example, the best results, the most interesting things happen during coffee break, because that's where there is no, where people meet uh, and there is less, less pressure, less like this professional prestige idea going on. Um, yeah, I'm at my five, min five minutes. I think I keep it here. Thank you. Thank you so much, Valentin. Uh also for being super on time. And I think I would like to come back to the lessons learned and collected uh, from the quotes in the Q&A session. Uh, thank you for now. Uh, and let me move on to our next speaker from Albania. Yonida Gashi is a cultural theorist based in Tirana, Albania. She's currently working on a research project on the newsreels and documentary films of the Albanian communist show trials. Her research interests include contemporary art theory and criticism, the philosophy of time and theories of repetition, film theory and the history of cinema, and the artistic experience of post-socialism in contemporary Albania. She's one of the founders of the Batik Center of Contemporary Art, alongside Armando Lulai and Ploirad Xafa. Following and understanding a community are the building blocks of collaboration, and Yonida will give us her view from Albania. Yonida, our virtual floor is yours. Thank you so much, Maria Luisa, uh, for the introduction too long, my bio, <laughs> sorry for that. Um, I'm really glad to be part of this panel and to be part of this series of talks. Uh, and uh, in a way it's very fitting that my presentation is straight after Valentin's because uh, Valentin's presentation was quite uh, optimistic and positive. Mine is gonna be a little bit more negative as the title suggests. So my presentation is about the cooptation uh, of collaboration, uh, right? Uh, and it's about the case of Albania. Um, 
the barriers and challenges to collaboration that uh, Albanian art and cultural workers face are indeed many, and some of them will be very familiar to everybody uh, on this panel and those of us, those of you following us. Uh, and they include precarious working conditions. Uh, you can see some examples on the slide, as well as uh, some structural problems, which may be more particular to the uh, stage of development of the Al Albanian art system. And they include uh, the under developed art market, uh, uh, collecting being a still nascent phenomenon and uh, the absence largely uh, of the figures of the curator and the art critic. I will focus in this short presentation, however, on another challenge to collaboration uh, within the Albanian art scene, and that is the radical politicization of contemporary art in particular since 2013, when uh, the Albanian people elected a self-proclaimed artist, politician to the post of uh, prime minister, which has created a climate of divisiveness and mistrust amongst art and cultural workers in the country. Now, as an astute observer uh, of the Albanian art scene and of the evolution of Edi Rama's uh, artist politician persona over the years, uh, has pointed out recently, and I've included a little reference at the bottom of the slide uh, for those of you who may be interested to follow up. Uh, the figure of the artist prime minister is an inherently paradoxical one. Uh, so these are two positions that pull both in the same direction, but also in opposite directions. And I will read out the quote because it's a really nice one. Um, so here goes. To govern a country whilst being governed oneself by alternate, potentially stronger artistic positions is not an easy scenario. And one way to resolve this awkward imbalance is by raising oneself to the status of artist sovereign. Uh, now, of course, in the case of Edirama in Albania, they did not happen overnight, it happened over, over years, right? Uh, and what we have basically seen is the institution of a dominant artistic paradigm in the country, uh, which has been followed outside of the art sphere by an increasingly authoritarian governing style and the relentless pursuit of what can only be described as neoliberalism on steroids, on the economic um, Front. Now, the curious thing, uh, which is very pertinent to our meeting tonight, about this dominant artistic paradigm is that uh, connectivity and collaboration are at the heart of it and we're at the heart, heart of it from the outset. And why is that curious? That's curious because when we think of connectivity and collaboration, we automatically instinctively associate them with openness and, uh, and democ democracy. We don't associate them with closed anti-democratic systems or orders. Um, I will give an example, obviously, uh, of how that is not the case. Uh, and I will go back to the very famous uh, Tirana Facades project uh, in 2001, a project initiated by Edirama when he was mayor uh, and involving the painting uh, of, the of the facades of the socialist era apartment blocks of Tirana. Uh, in 2003, in the context of the Tirana Biennial, uh, this project initiated by Edirama saw the involvement of, uh, of many internationally renowned artists, right? Like Olafur Eliasson, Liam Gillick, uh, and uh, Rirkriti Ravanesia, and there were many more, right? Um, and this went on throughout the first decade of the 20th century. Uh, the biennial form itself is a form associated with connectivity and collaboration and openness and uh, democracy, right? And it has been criticized for at least providing the illusion that it automatically offers all of these things. And incidentally, uh, the founding uh, performance of Debatic Center of Contemporary Art occurred during, uh, as a satellite project uh, uh, of the 2003 Tirana Biennial. And uh, it was a criticism uh, of this illusion and openness of uh, democracy. All right, uh, and the basically the performance consisted of the painting of the flags of uh, of the non-invited countries, which were laid out just uh, outside of the main uh, venue, uh, and uh, the installation lasted for about ten minutes, uh, which is the time uh, it took basically for the traffic to swallow up uh, the installation. So it was essentially like a, a, an imaginary pavilion de de dedicated to all the countries that had not uh, been. Included included uh, in the biennial. Um, but let me bring up the discussion to the present. Um, 
this dark side of connectivity and collaboration. The problem with it is uh, that what at first sight looks like a dynamic community of artists, architects, curators, writers, and so on can turn out, and in the case of Albania has turned out, to be a small clique of people primarily connected through their mutual interests. Uh, and the aura that this small clique uh, lends to the artist sovereign can be used as a means of lending an air of legitimacy or credibility to corrupt projects, especially outside of the country, whilst at the same time stifling dissent at home by undermining the authority and effectiveness of local voices and local critics, uh, because their platform is just not the same as those of internationally renowned artists, curators, and so on. That said, I think there is a silver lining to all of this, uh, the cooptation of connectivity and collaboration by the state. And that silver lining is that this has raised the stakes, I think, uh, for what art and cultural producers and workers should strive towards when it comes to connectivity and collaboration. Uh, and I think we had an excellent example of that uh, in Albania in May 2020, when the Rama government violently demolished the historic building of the Albanian National Theatre in order to enable the transfer of public land into private ownership and make way for the erection of a series of commercial high rises. Uh, a significant portion of the Albanian art scene rallied together behind an open letter public calling for the art watching of our prime minister's politics by the international art world or a certain faction of the international art world to stop. And instead they sought solidarity uh, from the international art world uh, with activists and artists and cultural producers in Albania. And I must say, as one of the initiators of the letter, that it has actually uh, been extremely produ productive simply because it has started uh, so many conversations with so many individuals as well as organizations in the region and beyond uh, who are not aware of what was going on in Albania and thanks to this letter at least uh, now can uh, ask the right questions and do uh, a little bit of research to inform themselves better. I think I'll, I'll close now. I think I ran over time. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Yonida, so much for sharing these insights and, and giving us, like, opening a little door, you know, a window uh, into what's happening. Um, and I'm sure you can tell us more about the local context and international collaborations in the Q&A. Maybe there's uh, some question from our audience. Uh, now, the last two speakers will offer a closer look at bigger European uh, projects and initiatives and their networking experiences. So first, let me introduce Michalis Karakatsanis from Cyprus. Michalis is since 2009 the administrator of the Cyprus Music Information Center, an organization with a mission to promote and encourage development, dissemination and appreciation of music of Cypriot music artists. He has taken an active role in a number of local and international projects. His research interests include the legitimization discourses and future of cultural policies and the political economy of the cultural and creative sectors. Michalis is elected to the boards of the European Music Council and the International Association of Music Information Centers, where he has been appointed as president since 2018. In parallel, he's an active musician. Michalis, welcome and let us hear from you now. Hello, Maria Luisa, thank you very much for the introduction. Let me just say for it's, it's a pleasure to be able to, to share this virtual panel with such a great team of, of speakers. I will be talking a little about a, a project and the process actually uh, connecting my uh, contribution to what Valentin said actually, uh, which a process that the European Music Council uh, initiated and uh, I will try to flip the mood and be some more positive actually. But before I continue, yeah, I think it's, it will be good to say a few words about the European Music Council. So what exactly is European Music Council? It's, it's an umbrella organization for the musical life in Europe. 
It's a non-profit organization that is dedicated to the development and promotion of all genres and all types of music in Europe. It's a network that promotes and supports music-related activities for representatives of national music councils and European and international networks involved in the fields of music education, creation, performance, participation, production, and heritage. Uh, EMC was founded in 1972. Today has more than 75 member organizations in 28 countries in, in Europe and beyond. And, and it actually started as a regional group for the International Music Council, which was initiated by UNESCO. There are three kinds of membership types uh, at EMC. First of all, is the National Music Councils, which is uh, are associations that uh, organizations that broadly broadly represent the music life of of its country and demonstrate that they subscribe to the uh, IMC's position of cultural rights and develop policy positions to advance the musical life of their country. Second type is the European International Organizations, and the third one is the National Space Specialized Organizations. EMC has three core objectives, activating the music sector, strengthening the music sector and connecting with and beyond the music sector. And by that, we mean that we try to voice the needs and interests of the whole music sector of Europe by bringing together representatives of European music networks, organizations, associations of all fields. And, and thus, EMC serves as an influential advisory body for political decision makers when it comes to discussing music and its impact on a pan-European level, and especially through our, our latest initiative, the European Agenda for Music, which I will be talking more about later, EMC managed to brought together for the first time representatives of the of both the non-for-profit sector, music sector, and the commercial or business sectors to speak for one with one voice. You can find more information about the about the EMC at our website. You can see it on the screen. But I will now continue and to talk a little about the European Agenda for Music. What is a European Agenda for Music, first of all? Uh, it's a project, it's a, it's a process, it, it, it's, it's an advocacy document and a policy document. But first of all, it's a participatory process. Uh, the European Agenda for Music was developed out of a continent-wide consultation launched by the European Music Council. Uh, EMC reached out to the entire music sector and trying to identify the sector's collective needs and set of priorities for the future. And European Agenda, Agenda for Music, it acts as a powerful confirmation of the European music sector desire to join together in the promotion of a common cause, which the agenda details and, and shows which directions to pursue in order to ensure a music sector that remains strong, fair, innovative, and diverse in a rapidly changing world. Why we, we thought that we need a European agenda for music? First of all, we believe that the whole, this whole process will help, will help the sector to identify our collective needs. What do we need actually to, to accomplish? Uh, and, and then proceed to set out priorities for the future work, and join and work together in the promotion of a common cause and afterwards advocate and, and a push for, for changes for a strong, fair, innovative, fair and diverse music sector. The European Agenda for Music tries to converge the, the European music sector many voices in order to establish an ongoing dialogue between policy makers and music uh, sector stakeholders. I will, I will say a few things about how the structure, the framework of the agenda. Uh, the European Agenda for Music puts forward three core objectives for the European music sector related to education and access to music, 
to diversity of the music sector and to the ability and the power of music to shape society. In order to reach this goal, uh, the European Agenda identified it three areas of actions consisting of technology, mobility, and recognition and appreciation of the artists. And uh, all of these themes are served by the following means, cooperation, partnership, dissemination, and data collection and analysis. That's, these are the nine key themes of the European Agenda for Music. I, I, will, uh, I will share with you later some uh, more information and links about to, to if you want to, to see uh, further details. So now I'll talk how we got here. Uh, discussions about this, about the need for uh, designing a, a European Agenda for Music started as early as 2012 amongst the AMC members. Uh, and therefore, recognizing the need for, for, for action, uh, European Music Council reached out to music stakeholders across Europe and reached out uh, virtually through an online consultation that was sent out to all music uh, organizations, networks, platforms, you know, the whole over Europe. And drawing on the conclusions from this initial survey, as well as, as, well as, as some very specific documents, in, including EMC's manifestos for youth and music in Europe, the UNESCO 2005 Convention of the Protection and Promotion of the Diversity of Cultural Expressions, and also <clears throat> taking into consideration the AB Music Working Group report that was published in 2016 and was used as the basis to, for the designing of the of European Commission's new funding program, Music Moves Europe. Uh, EMC defined seven fields of action in the music sector, and therefore seven working groups were composed out of expert representatives from those fields. Uh, and people in these uh, in these working groups convened several times to debate and identify specific needs in these areas. Their findings were drawn up and submitted for review in a targeted consultation involving also EMC members, working group members, and the EMC and the EMC board. Uh, the key for the success of an endeavor like that, uh, like this actually is, is to represent the diverse needs and priorities of the sector. That was our first, our first thought and uh, our first problematic that we needed to tackle. Uh, for such a, such a document to be valid, it needs to reflect the interest of all stakeholders in the European music sector from commercial to creative to educational or non-profit or amateur music. And in order to ensure that, EMC invited all its members as well as other significant non-member non -member organizations to join the debate on what actions need to be taken to secure a musically thriving Europe in the future. The, what we found out is that after the, the, the working groups met, their work disproved the prevailing notion that economic and artistic and non-for-profit interests cannot sit comfortably side by side. On the contrary, uh, as issues and concerns were debated through all these processes and, and talks and debates and uh, consultations, it became apparent that, the, that everyone in the music sector actually in Europe uh, uh, pretty much share the same priorities when working towards a common interest, of course, the protection and promotion of European music. So this, uh, this horizontal approach that uh, European Agenda for Music <coughs> uh, took over, uh, brought together the music industry and the civil society organizations for music, giving ev everyone an equal voice. And this is what makes European Agenda for Music both distinct and unique. It is the European music sector itself that speaks in these documents with clear objectives and priorities agreed upon by all. And let me just say that more than 90 organizations, networks and professional associations have embraced, signed and uh, support European agenda for music and use it as an advocacy tool 
uh, when talking with uh, with policymakers, and uh, and it, I would I also say that this, this is a living document. EMC already published the second edition of um, of European Agenda for Music, and we are now working towards the third edition that will include a, a, a specific section uh, dealing with how to to walk out and deal with the repercussions of the COVID-19 situation. You can find more information about the European Agenda for Music on, 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 our, on the website, uh, where we will find with more details about the key themes and about the priorities and suggested measures. And uh, I will end here and thank you everyone. And please visit also our website for this of, of Cyprus Music Information Center. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Michalis, for taking us through the processes of setting up the agenda. Uh, it looks to me like this can be a really interesting case study for other art fields and maybe we get back to that uh, later in the Q&A. Uh, now our last speaker for today comes from Greece. I would like to introduce you to Clary Bakura. Clary grew up in Larissa and returned there after her studies and work in London. She's a START fellow and during her fellowship she implemented the project The Heritage of Taste documenting cultural practices related to food and health through oral history interviews with the senior population of Larissa. She's currently working at the Institute of Entrepreneurship Development as the project's communication manager. She will present to us how the Institute develops infrastructures for collaborations at local and international level. Clary, the floor is yours. Thank you, Maria Luisa. Good afternoon to all. Um, I'm delighted to participate in this uh, series of uh, visual conversations as a uh, start program has been, uh, <coughs> excuse me, seminal for my professional development as a creative force that put uh, me and I guess all of the fellows in the process uh, to unlearn, to reconsider the old and um, create space for the new. In this context uh, of what we relearn as impact as a strategic collaborations and their acceleration, I will share with you the design of Joist, a practical model of a business innovation hub that uh, will be we build in Larissa in uh, central Greece. Joist aims at uh, functioning as a restorative and accelerating venue for international collaborations. Very briefly to introduce uh, very briefly, to introduce our organization, we are the Institute of Entrepreneurship Development. Uh, we are based in Larissa since uh, 2005. We are 55 people with creative presence in 40 countries, uh, having implemented more than 250 projects. And uh, we aim, we keep on um, investing in our network in uh, in Europe, all across Europe, and uh, through Joyce, we aim to expand and uh, further utilize our uh, our network through Joyce. Uh, we implement European uh, Union funded research projects. We run the IED Educational Academy and uh, we also run the IED network of Europreneurship, uh, all of which initiatives aim at functioning as a separate but combined also network channels and uh, all of which will be housed at Joist, which is going to function as a digital um, as a digital innovation hub, because actually we strongly believe that uh, digital transformation is of crucial importance for collaborations, especially with a focus in southeastern Europe, um, where the digital transformation has uh, uh, its own particular rhythms combined um, uh, compared to the rest of uh, of Europe. Uh, going back to Joist, we have identified four clusters. The first is the educational technology. Uh, second is the materials and construction, uh, the industry 4.0. Then it's uh, e-health and then it's uh, the um, agrotech uh, culture. All of these clusters will be under the umbrella of Joist and can adapt to the local, national, European and also international innovation environments and generate growth in uh, financial and uh, social terms. 
These four clusters will be our flagship thematics, uh, offering uh, under the roof of Joyce a range of services, ecosystem building, technology services, and business services, all being open to as wide an audience as possible, because this is our actual goal. And here is where, for us, restoration and uh, acceleration practically come, in a place where diverse audience will meet and will be invited to, col to collaborate and build a collaboration per se, rather than continuing to develop their initiatives um, separately. Uh, this is the key, according to our philosophy, unite and utilize, utilize and then unite all the available resources for positive impact as we need to unlearn digital transformation as uh, something that threatens so societies in the way we know them and relearn it as a powerful tool for connecting various stakeholders. Of course, when we talk about restoration, uh, we need to identify, let's say, the damage that needs to be fixed. We believe, as far uh, from our research, we believe that this damage uh, in quotation marks, of course, uh, is the lack of uh, connecting tissues between different entities that can really collaborate with a mutual goal, that of growth. So our position towards restoration and uh, accelerations, acceleration of collaborations is a model that houses people, their visions and ideas, and under the same roof, offers the resources for their implementation. Uh, at the Institute, we plan to make Joyce a center that will uh, facilitate collaboration on all levels with a particular geographical uh, focus at the beginning in Southeast uh, Europe. Thank you. Thank you very much, Clary. Um, I look forward to seeing this becoming a reality. Uh, I hope very soon. And I believe that our audience would like to know more about ways to collaborate with the new hub. Uh, so let us move on and forward to the questions. And let me remind you that you can participate in the conversation by sharing uh, any questions or comments through the Slido app. You can download the app either through the Google Play or through the App Store. The event code is hashtag 31467 and you can also participate through the Facebook live stream. Um, now we have already received a few questions and uh, from our audience through the Slido app and I would like to start with that um, and maybe a question for uh, you Darius. I, we had a small technical issue but uh, we heard very well uh, your presentation and uh, so the question is what are your predictions on the effect of technological achievements in building partnerships and collaborations? And are there any tools to suggest? And I'm saying this because we just heard from uh, Clary Bakura about the digital transformation. Uh, it didn't just happen overnight because of COVID, but it is really important. So please. Thank you very much, Maria Luisa. I'm sorry for this inconvenience. Sorry. Uh, and thank you to your team that at the end brought me in. So great to be with you. Um, yes, I think the digital transformation is the basis for what we understand network building itself. I think just through this elements we're using now and in a way also through the Corona crisis, we learned so much. I can just say from our organization, we moved forward uh, into a radically new space, how to connect people and build collaboration and um, first of all contacts. And I see here one point. When we talk about transactional costs, what I said before, um, we talk about geographic barriers. And I think technology is one instrument um, to tackle these this, um, barriers. At the same time, um, we all feel tired by using this technological issue. So at the end, I, I think we will end up in a hybrid environment where we will mix up both the, the technological issue that help us to, to cross over um, even continents and at the same time to stay connected. I don't have I don't have a tool. I think at the end and right now we are in a period where we are mixing the tools and I mean I don't have to name all the tools. We are all experimenting with, with those. At the end uh, it would be great to have a community of practice that is sharing the experiences. Uh, for example we're doing this um, on online facilitation on our platform but yes I know 
Um, it's a plurality of tools. Uh, sometimes it's a mobile phone that is helping to join uh, conversations like now. Um, yeah, stop, full stop here. Not one single tool. At the end, it will be a hybrid environment we will work in. Thank you. Thank you for this uh, input. Um, I have a question from our audience for Yonida, um, which is uh, the following. How can we give valuable context of our local problems to international audiences that will help accelerate collaboration in the region? And this may be connected to some tools or technological uh, you know, solutions, but maybe not. So yes, uh, how, how can we do this with the context? That's a really great question, Maria Luisa. Um, I'm not sure I have a definitive answer, <laughs> but, uh, but uh, in the case of Albania, uh, the problem was that the, the official narrative uh, was uh, was so attractive, was so sexy almost uh, that people were not uh, were not willing. A lot of people living outside of Albania were not willing to uh, kind of scratch the surface and look uh, beneath the surface. Uh, right. So this was an added layer of com complexity. Uh, to the fact that Albania is a peripheral country, there is, in any case, very little interest. Added to the fact that I think all of us working in the art and cultural sectors did not do enough to inform people uh, outside, potential partners, potential colleagues outside of Albania. We did not do enough. Uh, and yes, we, I don't think we used enough the uh, available technologies, um, whether that be, you know, th things that are standard now, uh, social media, Facebook, Instagram, uh, Twitter, and so on. I don't think we did enough to, uh, to inform people, to pique their curiosity. Uh, so in the end, I think it, it's, it's going to have to be uh, a, a kind of meeting in the middle situation. You know, we have to do more to inform, uh, but also uh, people, potential, uh, potential collaborators and colleagues and partners have to do more research and be willing to inform themselves and learn before engaging in the country uh, in particular. Yeah, um, I, I hear from you that there is an aspect of responsibility. Uh, you mentioned, uh, you know, how much do we do from a community towards informing and sharing, as Darius mentioned, uh, what's happening, where's the context, where are we standing today? Um, thank you so much. And, and quite similar to that, another question from our audience to Michalis. Um, the question is, due to social distancing, are advocacy procedures going to be affected and more centralized decisions from the EU Commission will be taken? So how do you see this after this experience uh, with the agenda? Uh, if we're talking about the Commission's, uh, European Commission's own uh, structured dialogue about policy uh, I, I from my experience it seems that they still continue the the, the, the whole the so-called structured dialogue with the sector the cultural sector uh, as was initiated uh, some years ago through but not not anymore through uh, through face-to-face uh, -face physical uh, meetings but uh, of course through virtual and uh, online online tools uh, of course um, I think that the coronavirus is affecting every aspect of, of, of the of the cultural sector everywhere it, it, nothing uh, will will still be the same after after what we are going through. Uh, but the processes, the structures, and the the way of doing things, I don't think that they are going to change. We we, are, we might try, we might change the tools that we we use in order to to debate and discuss amongst us. But uh, uh, the frameworks and and, and the, the the whole processes that our dialogues, our debates are based upon, I don't think that. Uh, we change because it's 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 um, it's there. These are processes that we 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 took many many years to establish, and in order to to get our voices heard. And I don't think that this is something that we get abolished so easily because of the coronavirus. 
So if I if I understand well, and it relates obviously to what everyone else mentioned, uh, it is about a, a strong process being organically built from the bottom up, and then there comes the outcome. And that leads me to also another question uh, to Clary, um, which has to do with processes more or less. And it is, uh, how are you planning to build international collaborations uh, through the new hub? Because it is one thing to have an organization that is doing research and European projects in various fields, but what is the new, what is new with the hub? Considering that the hub might not be a, a, a space for meeting for some time, at least due to COVID, but what is then the process of doing so in Southeast Europe, as you mentioned, and internationally, based on the experience of the Institute? Well, um, apart from uh, expanding on, uh, on the existing network, which has uh, started uh, to started in 2005. So as you can uh, imagine, it's, uh, I would say, lengthy, <laughs> if it's not an understatement. Um, apart uh, so for, of expanding on that, uh, the hub will be open to freelancers, it will be open to the public, and uh, it will have a particular focus uh, in small and medium-sized enterprises. And uh, the master plan, in terms of networking, is to create the mother database as we call it so everyone every organization uh, according to the cluster or uh, according to categories because four clusters are not going to be enough uh, obviously uh, they will uh, input um, contacts they will uh, input uh, stakeholders and uh, then probably, I mean, it is in very initial stages, but this is the master plan to create a very big database uh, with geographical focus and uh, with a thematic focus. So every person, organization, institution who has um, a relationship with the hub in any capacity uh, will uh, input the contacts and then we plan to create a very big network uh, for entrepreneurship, social and, um, and cultural. That was my actual next question coming from Slido. I mean, what is, because you mentioned generally, you mentioned agro uh, and health. So what is the, the, um, the focus of this? So I think you've already uh, answered and, and thanks for that. And talking about the expansion, um, I would like to ask uh, um, Valentin uh, a question about the findings uh, from the research. Um, so if I understood well, you did a survey and some live meetings. Uh, and uh, through that, you um, understood the difference between the process-oriented and the product-oriented. Uh, funding. So, are there any fi further findings about networking for funding, if, if that makes sense, at least to, to your research, of course? Um, yes, so first of all, networking would have been the next step as a finding also that this is what we wanted to do. We wanted to, um, for this to be really a mutual conversation as a round table, the next step would have been to meet funders. Uh, first of all, we collected through the survey mainly um, best practice examples and identified a number of funders that we wanted to talk to in, in kind of interview situations to then open up the conversation, really inviting workers and funders. Um, that didn't happen due to Corona. So that's, that's kind of in the pipeline. We're waiting for it. Uh, and I'm still very curious about that. And then in terms of um, network, I think a, a lot of the conversations we had were really how can, how can the existing funding structures be more peer oriented? Maybe that's the term. Um, and in that allow for input that is in a way surprising because a lot of the conversations circulated around the notion when we say product oriented funding, then that means kind of a, a business like adopted maybe from from capitalism from like or like from business logic uh, of you apply with something that is pretty waterproof and that um, that people know that invest the money that it's kind of there um, and yet we are talking I mean this whole conversation of the roundtable happens within the frame of culture 
we're talking arts and culture uh, and social culture a lot. And there we're not talking huge numbers usually. Like if you have a 250,000 euro grants, that's already a big thing. And that's already usually over several years. So in the end, it's never, you know, compared to the money that goes around in the world, um, this, this relation of security and in a way also worries, mistrust, fear, maybe, um, is, is probably not really justified to the measures you have to take to give to create a feeling of okay, we know exactly what we're going to do, and usually what that leads to is that you write your you write your project. You have to invent and know everything that which is not paid. That time is not paid unless you have a fixed contract. But most people that we talk to in that field are freelancers of some sort. So you invest all that time, and within that you define a specific slot for participants. But in that sense, the participants that like yeah participatory side often becomes kind of it has a very defined role because everything else has to be built beforehand. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And that's kind of like, if you think of networks and the way that we, when we talk international networks and peer to peer uh, dynamics, then this allows much more for the entry of other knowledge of, of contributions that no one was thinking about, you know, like someone that walks in or because uh, meeting someone that is from a totally different field, which I hear also um, of the Clare and the and the center, like a place where people can encounter each other. Um, so yeah, in terms of no, in, of networks, I think I think that's a perspective. Thank you. Um, there is another question uh, coming uh, from our audience, um, and it has to do. It's a little bit around what uh, Valentin mentioned. So the question is for Darius: uh, In collaboration, there is a contradiction between self-organization and leadership. How can we find the meeting point to create an effective network? So it, it, somehow it has to do with what Valentin mentioned about how are we standing as professionals and as funders, whether practitioners or funders, towards what we're going to, to produce or, or to exchange, at least? Thank you very much. I think this, this question goes into the core of uh, what I tried to explain. And I don't see a contradiction here between uh, self-organization and leadership. In the contrary, I think we have to uh, reshape our understanding of leadership if it comes to networks and understand that a leader in network is a facilitator who takes care of specific roles. I tried to mention two or three or four, like bridge builders, the influencers, and um, sees them, sees what is happening within the network, sees the patterns that are happening, and in a way is um, supporting the creation of, of new constellations. So for me, it's a, it's a shift. I think for us in the cultural sector, not such a big shift of what we understand leadership for some others might be a big shift, but leader, the, the new leader is the caretaker of the serendipity moments in a complex system. So it's somebody who sees what is emerging, somebody who's supporting this emerging one, and in a way is staying in the background. Um, and this might be the contrary to the, our usual understanding of a, of a leader. Thank you. Um, it is very interesting, actually, what you just mentioned about leadership. Uh, and I would like to uh, go uh, with this topic uh, to Michalis for a question, uh, because you mentioned, Michalis, that it was maybe a first, if I got this right, uh, that the agenda brought together the commercial and the nonprofit, the civil society uh, around music and the producers. So. Um, how did this work? I mean, how did you manage, let's say, in such a wide, uh, I have something like uh, 90, I think you mentioned 90 organizations signed uh, this document. So how did this work? Um, you know, who led and, and, and who followed or how, I mean, I'm really intrigued uh, with this issue of leadership in networks. Yes, uh, first of all, uh, as I told you, as I, I told you before, the whole procedure and the whole process was initiated by EMC, which is an organization that is very well uh, regarded among both the amateur music making world 
and the commercial music world and, and the business side and everything it's because of course because it's a it's it's a poll it's a political uh, organization that advocates for music in europe and uh, because we started like that uh, it, it was easier it was not easy but it, it was easier let me just say uh, so now in terms of leadership um, we tried uh, first of all to to make participants to feel that they own the whole process first of all that everyone has a share out of this process and uh, the, when the working groups were established uh, we gave uh, the floor to the participants of the working group to to somehow uh, decide together who will who will lead the discussions but uh, um, the working groups themselves had representatives from both the commercial and the not-for-profit sector uh, so some working groups were led by uh, experts and uh, representatives of co the commercial side especially the, those those in those areas that had to deal with uh, strictly the commercial side of uh, the, 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 the business side of music, but some other workshops were chaired and lead, led by representatives from the non-for-profit sector, music sector. So it was a joint decision. Mm -hmm. um, it it sounds like uh, like a good model, but if I also understand well, um, and this leads us also to uh, associations maybe building or network building. Um, in the music sector, there were already groups, organized groups that had a representative and those representatives came together and started working on the agenda through the, um, the music council. Is that so? Yeah, uh, as I told you before, the EMC, the, the membership, uh, topography, let's say, the, the geography of, of the members of, of EMC is not just specific uh, uh, organizations, regional or national organizations, but EMC has, as, as, the, as its members, also networks. So mm -hmm. it's, it's, it is somehow uh, EMC operates as a network of networks. Mm -hmm. So that's the procedure. That this is how how we manage to get people from both from the commercial sector to send their representatives and the non for profit sector also, uh, because EMC was le was leading actually the the whole process. This is this is this is the most interesting point, especially for southeastern Europe, and I would like also to to hear from Yonida the, uh, her experience in Albania um, because. Uh, also in Greece, we face this uh, aspect of not being organized enough uh, as professionals in the cultural sector. And this obviously leaves us sometimes outside the advocacy and policy um, making. So um, I would like to ask you, Yonida, if you can share with us and or give us some input about the situation in Albania and also if this process with a letter, for example, that you mentioned and, uh, and, and the rally, do you think such processes can initiate uh, a network building between professionals in Albania? Um, excellent question. Thank you very much. Um, I think, uh, honestly, that um, organizations uh, in the Albanian art and cultural sector would benefit greatly uh, from, uh, from collaborating, organizing and trying to build a network. Uh, the reasons why that has happened are extremely complex. You know, I just scratched a tiny little bit the surface of it in my presentation uh, and there's no point in me going into it now, but I actually think they would benefit enormously. Uh, at the same time, uh, I want to give the example of, of, of two protests. Uh, and a, I know protest is not a network, but uh, <laughs> I, will I think it's still a useful uh, example, right? Uh, because it really emphasizes the problem uh, between this sort of antagonism and conflict between self-organization and leadership. Uh, the 
protest organized by artists and actors and activists uh, to protect the Albanian National Theatre, the historic building of the theatre, um, did not really have a leader. It had a lot of factions which were kind of moving and shifting over the couple of years that it lasted, but it did not really have a leader. And that is one reason why it survived for as long as it did. And uh, an even better example is the example of the student protests, which we had in uh, um, in January 2019, which had a very horizontal structure. They didn't really have a leadership. And that turned out to be a, an extremely useful tactic, specifically in Albania, because as a rule of thumb, uh, all attempts at organization uh, in Albania are uh, are attacked by uh, political forces usually uh, or their business uh, partners uh, are attacked uh, specifically by targeting leaders or hierarchical structures. Uh, so these two protests are kind of an example uh, of uh, of how escaping uh, sort of uh, hierarchical structures with uh, with obvious leaders is uh, is a way of trying to evade uh, political influence and uh, and kind of the crumbling uh, of the organization due to political influence and I think to go back to the art and cultural sector specifically uh, I think that one networks and collaboration is very important. I think perhaps it's necessary to find uh, uh, to find some kind of novel way uh, of doing it, uh, of doing it, which is uh, which is specifically adapted to the conditions uh, in this country and takes into consideration uh, uh, the way uh, in which uh, in which previous attempts um, have have failed and the reasons why. Um, I believe you need, I mean, thank you for, sh for sharing this. And I believe this is the, the most interesting part, uh, the adaptation, because if you all recall when the European Union got together uh, many years ago, uh, initially we all tried to implement one model for all countries, which we saw later that it didn't function very well because we have the disparities. And this is exactly what you're talking about. How can we do it in Albania? How can we do it in Greece, in Germany? How can we learn from each other? But always uh, focus on, on the local parameters, on the local culture. And what you just mentioned, not having a leader worked, uh, has to be taken into consideration seriously uh, on that. And uh, may I then move to a question for Valentin, um, because it is about getting back the message from the field work to the funders. And I am sure that Darius might also have a comment to do on that because, uh, you know, um, the EAC Berlin is very close to, to funding uh, structures. But Valentin, um, what could you take from this survey when very soon I hope you're going to uh, speak to funding organizations that you have identified as uh, important in this aspect? I mean, are, have you identified any specificities in, in countries or regions? Um, a special model, for example, like Yonida mentioned, that uh, could be interesting for our audience tonight? Uh, well, actually, in terms of regional differences, we had um, one participant that came from um, Central Africa and we had lots of uh, North African contribution. Um, and what we realized, but that was already a process that I was um, becoming aware of, especially through Tandem, the working in Tandem, which is also working within the MENA region. Um, is something that is rather sad, actually, is that this model of, th of, of thinking um, in securities and thinking along the lines of business plans when it comes to how the applications are designed, how the juries function and so on, with a less and less direct contact of like knowing your peers, um, which like, you know, Darius, if he, if he describes the leader as a host, um, that's not usually how, how I relate with my funder. In, in many, many cases. There is cases, but then usually it becomes more a structure where there is a funder like the IAC or, or also START, for example, that delegates money. Like an, in, there is an intermediate body of people who really know their piece and the people and the community and then know what's going on um, and can identify where is something emerging. But usually that's not the case. And actually that model of um, calls and uh, the topics are given 
um, which might so actually that leads to the dynamic that many people are always trying to fit what they actually want to do into the topic that the call gave out. Um, and then you, you, you like often don't really do what you want to do or what is meaningful for your community. Um, that this is a model that is spreading and that has been going more like the Arabic region has been taking this up. That's what we got as a feedback. Um, that, I mean, our Central African partner was more talking about anyways, that there is the funders that they, that he works with are anyways, the Central European or Western European partners, that there is not too many foundations, um, working down there. Um, yeah, so as like in, in a, in a wider regional context, that's something with worries kind of to, to describe, uh, that something is, uh, developing. Um, thank you, Valentin. It's, uh, it's actually quite interesting to see how, how models uh, perpetuate somehow from one region to another. Um, and uh, um, I mean, I think I would like to ask you, Darius, uh, the similar thing. You know, what is your experience with funders and by managing a wide network of professionals who by default have some experience with application writing, if, I, if I'm correct? So, it's not the ones that come to the EAC Berlin for the first time, they are alumni of several programs. So there is a kind of maturity. So on the other side, how do funders uh, perceive this peer connection or as Valentin mentioned, intermediaries or the models of uh, exchanging with the actual field workers in, in, uh, in our sector? Thank you very much. Um... I would like to start with the word uh, and the impression it's scary and it's uh, for foundation it's really scary what we are talking about here and I would express uh, what Valentin and, and, and the other colleagues are, are expressing is the um, is, a, is a process oriented work work uh, what we are talking about collaboration and um, distributing uh, power to the field this is extremely scary um, and why is it so because it's not the foundation, uh, it's not one entity, at, and to simplify, at, at least two. On one side, we have the program officers, very often very engaged people who want to contribute to a certain impact, they, they want to support uh, the projects. They work with their heart, and we have within the foundation a second chapter, um, and these are the people uh, working really with passion around the topic of charity laws. Uh, they are working around the topic how to um, support the foundation in being legally conformed to the regulations they are working in. And within the foundation, you have always this, um, this struggle and these discussions around how much autonomy we can give to the beneficiaries, how much trust we can give into them. And from the other part, you will always say the question, we would like to know what's the outcome. We would like to understand at the beginning what will be there because we have to describe it also to those who give us the money and that's, for example, the taxpayer. And I know colleagues in foundation having these discussions and you know, talking with, with them for the last two years, what we found out the only way is to create rooms, safe rooms where we can within the foundation also talk about it and find solutions, how to support um, the emergence of new ideas within the process on one side, because we know that with the old instruments, we cannot fight, we cannot tackle all these new, new challenges with all instruments. This everybody understands, but they are not yet that far to get there. And that's the same for us. I mean, uh, that's why I really like Valentin's project so much, because it's about inviting foundation to the same table, creating an eye level discussion and creating solutions together and not see each other as, well, enemies or parts of one or the other sector, but to see us as partners to find new solutions. And we need that, new solutions. Uh, sorry for being a bit on the side, but th there, is, there is a dialogue. I would call it, a, there is a dialogue about found, finding the right way happening within the foundation and also in the, in the dialogue between us, beneficiaries, uh, um, the backbone organizations and the foundations. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. It's, it's important to know. Sometimes we, uh, in the field, we imagine um, how things happen on the other side, but it's de very different. Uh, and I can say also this uh, from a personal experience coming from the field, being, uh, having uh, served uh, for the past five years through the START program, 
uh, is an intermediary, as, as Valentin mentioned, and understanding so much more and, and trying to open this dialogue. Um, and actually, one of our goals uh, for the Unlearning Talks is to share uh, what we're going to collect from all your uh, presentations and the discussions, the Q&A, and share it with as many foundations as possible at the end, because there's so much valuable information in there uh, and, and in the details, which actually affect how projects are run. So I would like to um, actually move on from this uh, in innovation, the, the autonomy you mentioned, um, uh, Darius, to a last question for, for all of you um, as we're moving on. And I will start from Clary. Actually, it, it comes from our audience. The question uh, for Clary is, um, how can we in more concrete actions democratize innovation? And maybe this is um, you know, a question for all of you. How can we be more inclusive in, in this process about doing experimental and in innovative work. Uh, so I, I can start with you, Clary, as you, you were working on an innovation hub. So maybe you can yeah, share. Yeah, that's, uh, that's very interesting. And actually is the question that uh, keeps transforming itself. Uh, I, I guess for all of us, uh, it seems like you reach an answer and then the same question uh, reappears and then you get an answer and then it, it keeps transforming itself. Um, at the stage uh, that uh, we are with Innovation Hub and uh, throughout my sociocultural experience I would say that the initial stages for innovation are information, information and information. People and that's what networks are about I, I'd say. People need to know what is going on. People need to be fully informed uh, about uh, the, their possibilities, about the capacities. Um, as Yurida said also, it's, it's all about knowing what, what is going on out there, whether it is uh, funding, uh, collaborations, um, things that they are going on on a political uh, level. Uh, and I think that technology is a crucial uh, asset on that. And then digital skills as well, so people will be able to know. And uh, I think that the baseline should be stop digging in for information. In, there, there should be a baseline where information is uh, fully available and fully accessible. And I, th I would say this is a milestone for our um, broad community. Thank you, thank you, Clary. Um, Michalis, um, what's, what's your uh, take on this? Uh, let me just say, but by, I am also involved, as you mentioned in my show bio, in the International Association of Music Information Centers. Uh -huh. so, so that thing, uh, that thing alone shows that how much I, all, I too believe in the information. Uh, uh, aspect and the information part for the for the innovation and the advancement of of the sector and uh, and I, I also truly think that uh, the the right way of collecting and sharing and uh, the information and and presenting also the information information to to various uh, uh, stakeholders and uh, actors. Uh, it's one of the crucial uh, tools that helps the sector to thrive, actually. Mm -hmm. This is my personal opinion. Thank you. Thank you, uh, To you, Valentin. Uh, I'm afraid my answer would be like a bit more abstract in the sense of like, because for me, this is a very pedagogical question, actually. Um, it's, a, it's a question of how I relate um, and how I design. So, you're talking about how can that be inclusive whatever we're doing um in our organization it's called other music academy because it's ultimately about otherness and when we talk about otherness it's also multiple intelligences it's acknowledging all the different modes and being actually really curious for all the different modes of being in the world that exist um, and that entails a certain a, a, a passion for learning for learning while you're doing your work to take basically any opportunity as a learning process that someone you didn't expect 
could teach you something. Um, and this demands actually for a baseline of security, which means a safety within yourself, like you, be, you have to be safe enough with yourself. Shame is an issue, insecurities of like not knowing things, not being able, not knowing how to do things. Um, and this for me starts in school, you know, like how we learn what learning means. Uh, and so I think our role is to relearn that, unlearn what we've learned. Um, opening ourselves and that also I mean one side of it is pretty existential it's also I think coming from you know the funding discussion if we're constantly in a precarious situations where we're fighting to just live <laughs> and we're constantly having one project in the pipeline while we're already planning the next because that's how we pay our rent then that's not a very good and safe space to start from so as a little sidekick, maybe like uh, the unconditional basic income is a good idea, uh, mm -hmm. but there might also be other models. Thank you. Um, thank you. Thank you for raising this, this point. It's very interesting about innovation and um, it is a baseline. Uh, so please, uh, you need uh, uh, your point about innovation and experimentation. I don't really have very much to say about innovation on the technological <laughs> level. That's beyond my area of expertise. But uh, what we have tried to do uh, with Debatic Center of Contemporary Art, which was reactivated um, in 2016-17 as a response to political developments, was uh, to, to not just give a space uh, uh, and a platform uh, to, to artists, but not only also thinkers, writers, activists, uh, who really didn't have uh, a platform to, to express themselves and their work. But throughout, in every project we do, uh, in every public announcement, uh, um, uh, to, to maintain uh, a kind of openness and transparency and accountability uh, of, of, of methods uh, through which, uh, through which, uh, and processes uh, through which uh, we carry out anything. And I think that's uh, extremely, but that's valid for, uh, for I think, technological innovation uh, as well. And I think it's extremely important to, to build, uh, again, uh, trust uh, and, and unity where there was uh, mistrust and, uh, and divisiveness. It's okay to have uh, to have to have conflicts of uh, be they pedagogical, abstract, theoretical, political, whatever. But but I think it's important uh, to have a kind of openness and transparency, trans transparency of means uh, and and processes. Uh, so that's what we we've kind of been about and try to be about uh, going forward. And I think that's that's important if you want to build a, um, a network that is uh, sustainable and has half of a chance of uh, of surviving. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Thank you, or even a quarter of a chance. Let's let's be. Uh, thank you for that. And I will close with you, uh, Darius, about this very question of democratizing the whole aspect of innovation and uh, experimentation. There is not much to add. I mean, the, the colleagues took the the keywords I was I was thinking about. So trust was was said that was said that we need a framework. We we have to be democratic about our methods. We should share that. Um, it's a, it's a, um, it's, it's about pedagogy. We have to de-learn things, but there's one thing maybe that is important in this framework, and it's the creativity. What we should do, we should celebrate craziness. We should be open to the artist minds bringing something totally new, even that irritates us in the first moment. I think the irritated elements. This is the beginning of democratizing, democrat, democratizing something new and. Um, yeah, let's let's celebrate artists, cultural workers. Let's celebrate those people who are bringing really new perspective into our lives. Um, that's maybe what I would like to do. Thank you so much, Darius. And, and uh, I would like to thank you all once more for your contributions today as speakers and joining us. Uh, it was really a pleasure uh, discussing uh, how can we have our networks working and beyond and go beyond personal and geographical borders. This is what I keep. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for having Thank us. You. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. Very Thank you also. To
the production team behind this online event, uh, we faced some challenges and they were solved and, and I thank them so much. And dear viewers, uh, thank you for being with us today and for all your questions. Uh, see you all in our last session tomorrow, Thursday, October 1st at 18 uh, hours European Eastern Time with the ninth and last talk on mapping new pathways for inclusive partnership building. So if what you heard today sounds interesting, I invite you to share your story by registering at our events page, startgreece.net website, and until then, stay safe and please join us on social media.